and also start video. Okay. Not perfect. Or... Ah, this camera? Okay. Yeah, now I can take this one. Okay. Everybody is muted. Is it supposed to be like this? Yeah. Yeah, and no cameras too? Yeah, it would be. Hello, everybody. It, hi. Hi. It would be nice. Hi. To okay, great. Can hear you in any case. Okay, so we are. We'll start our our second session of, of today's second session. Uh, my name is Ricardo Pontes Rezende. I'm a, a, a teacher here at ISCTE in the master's architecture master's degree. Um, and uh, we have um, uh, four papers, four works that will be presented. Uh, and they are, I will try to pronounce all the names because some of them might be difficult, but, and they are all on, on quite technological, of course, um, solutions for quite different problems. The first one is from June, how, who, um, and the, the title is Reconstructing Photogrammetric 3D Model by Using Deep Learning. So cloud points and, and uh, neural networks um, for, for 3D model reconstruction. The second one about space syntax applied to, to road networks from Tassus Varudis and Alan Penn, spectral clustering and integration, the inner dynamics, I have it here, the inner dynamics of computational geometry, geometry and spatial morphology. Then a third one by Andrew Malcolm and uh, Jerwan, uh, sorry, Werbrook and Peter Powells, uh, uh, L LBD servers visualizing building ontolo ontologies in web-based environments using GLTF models on uh, uh, cloud solutions for uh, for for building uh, visualization, beam models, and uh, and a fourth paper by Caterina Ruivo, David Viana, who is in the in, the, in here with us, Franklin Moraes, who is also with us and Isabel Carvalho and George Vaz. And here I said all the names because I can pronounce them without <laughs> mistakes. SCAVA tools, strategies and tools for the mass dissemination of SCAVA techniques. So I'll, I'll give the floor. I don't know who will pre be presenting the first work. Is it June or uh, June Hao? Yes. I am. Yeah, ah, it's okay. my paper, yeah, ah, there you are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. So please go ahead. I, I'll remind we have 15 minutes for each paper. So I'll, at 12 minutes, I will be uh, sending, a, a, I will be just telling uh, you to prepare to, to wrap up. So don't worry about the time. I will be, or please do worry about the time, but I will be sending a reminder that we are okay. approaching. Okay, yeah. no problem. Okay. Go ahead. So uh, you can hear me clear, right? Yeah. Quite clear. Okay, nice. So, uh, I'm going to show my slides. So uh, wait a minute. Can you see the slides? Okay. Yeah, we can. Okay, nice. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Ji Li Zhen. Uh, I'm a researcher and a lecturer uh, at National Jiao Tong University in Taiwan. And today I, I'm going to present uh, our research about uh, reconstructing a photogrammetric 3D model uh, with uh, deep learning. And uh, this research uh, that we uh, propose is to uh, reconstruct the uh, complex uh, 3D model by uh, photo scan. And because uh, uh, so far, uh, the photogrammetry is not quite uh, practical because when we use drone to take this photo, and we use the uh, software to generate this uh, model, and we always get a quite a complex and huge uh, models. So it's difficult to uh, be around uh, in certain uh, software. So that's why we 
uh, try to uh, develop a, a method to uh, deal with this problem. And we also have a previous uh, a paper and which is uh, published uh, in a K future uh, conference. And we uh, provide a method that can uh, separate the model, especially the uh, building volume, uh, separate them from the entire model. So we can separate them into a building model and uh, the, the terrain. Uh, but we uh, realized there was a problem that when we try to rebuild the model and it might be uh, influenced by the uh, quality of the uh, uh, the photo scan. So we uh, try to utilize uh, deep learning to uh, cope this problem. And in this paper, uh, it has two uh, main parts. The first part is a uh, turning gene and it is uh, built with uh, Grace Harper and uh, PyTorch. And the next part is the reconstruct process. And the process is built in uh, Grace Harper. And so we can uh, apply this uh, in a most design process because most uh, designer or architecture know about how to use uh, Grace Harper in architecture field. And this uh, definition in Grasshopper is to uh, generate the uh, archetypes of the uh, training data. And it can uh, generate various uh, kinds of the training data. Uh, of course, it is uh, artificial uh, data, but we realize that it is possible to apply in the a reality uh, scenario. And it is, uh, this image is the archetype of our training model. And we just randomly uh, generate the model and this model can uh, be a trend. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> and uh, we randomly uh, model, uh, modify each part of the model, uh, such as scale, Length width. So we use this to uh, stand for the uh, artificial uh, construction or uh, artificial objects in the field. And because the angle of each models are randomly, so we can use it to train the, our machine learning process to adapt a various kind of angle a scale or uh, the geometries. And this is the sample that we generate. And we generate uh, each uh, model uh, to be uh, different. And we can uh, generate tons of these kind of uh, outlines. Moreover, uh, we want to make our process to adapt a various kind of uh, noise and it might happen in reality. So we add the noise into our archetype so it can generate various kinds of uh, rock uh, outlines. And it's the form of the training data. And we choose the radian as the features. And the radian can be negative or uh, positive, and it might imply whether it is concave or a convex. And I use the color uh, gradient to uh, visualize the uh, value of the radian. And uh, so in our uh, data set, uh, there are two kinds of, of labels and the label zero stands for uh, corners and the label one uh, stand for the non corner part. And because in reality, uh, the non corner part is 
um, much more than the a cornered label data. So we want to make the process more uh, sensitive. So we set them uh, the uh, the amount of these two are the same. And on the right hand side, sorry, I, I need to hide this. Okay, so we uh, utilize a quite simple uh, neural network to, uh, to build the process. And the output is only one node because we only want, only need to uh, uh, evaluate the possibility of its uh, corner or non-corner. So if the uh, output value is zero, so it, or close to zero, it uh, might be a corner part. And if it's close to uh, value one, and it might be a, as a non-corner part. And this, the turning process, and it's a reveal that the machine learning can uh, figure out uh, which part is the true corner and it's quite precise. Then we can uh, use this process to uh, separate or uh, split the outline. Then we can uh, recontrast each group of the uh, control point to rebuild as a new uh, surface is yes. because we have the, okay. I also use it to uh, try to uh, deal with different kind of model. And I also compare it with a different component in Grasshopper. Uh, the, on the left hand side is the original control that I want to try, I want to test our uh, method. And the second column is the reduced component uh, to try to simplify the original contour. And in the uh, third column is using the uh, simplified to a uh, component in Grasshopper to uh, rebuild these, these models. And on the right hand side is our method. And we not only use uh, artificial outline to test our uh, machine learning, we also use the reality model to, to test it. So the result like this, and this model is uh, our campus. So you can uh, see the uh, red dot means uh, the corner that uh, has been detected so then we can use this corner to reduce the model and it, the model would be quite neat. And because we can rebuild the model as a, a surface with UV system, so we can apply it for a parametric design easily. So it could facilitate a designer or architect. So uh, let me uh, draw the uh, conclusion uh, of this paper. So first of all, a parametric dream method for training new neural network is proposed in this research. And we uh, realized that it is possible to apply uh, artificial data to train a neural network but it can also uh, fit the real situation. And the second is a uh, neat neural network can detect corner from the uh, context of serious radiant data efficiently and precisely because uh, our data can be viewed as uh, uh, one, uh, one the uh, data. So it's quite simple. So of course it can uh, speed up the process. And the uh, last one is a model a reconstructing process based on the corner detection method is proposed in this paper. And we rebuilt uh, the model as 
uh, grape. So it uh, consists of uh, uh, surfaces in Rhino. And these uh, references of this paper. And this research uh, was uh, supported by the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology uh, in Taiwan. And yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. And this is my presentation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, for your presentation and for keeping up quite within the time. I think we can advance for the next presentation and have all questions in, in the end. So please stand by. Um, our next presenter is uh, Andrew. Hi, it's Peter Pauls, exactly. So please yes. go, go ahead, you have the floor. Just a second. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Now I'm sharing my entire screen, so I hope there's not too many pop-ups uh, appearing. Um, okay, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Powell. I will be presenting this paper on the LBD server, uh, which is about visualizing building graphs in web-based environments using semantic graphs and GLTF models. So yes, quite technical. Uh, I'm presenting this on behalf of Andrew and Jeroen. Jeroen, he is in the call. Um, usually he would present or Andrew would present, but due to uh, illness, I decided to uh, take over presentation. Um, yet this really is a work from uh, by Andrew and Jeroen. Jeroen is doing a PhD now uh, in Ghent University. And I'm at, and also in RWT Aachen. And I'm in the meanwhile, in the, ended up in Eindhoven University. Um, just, I'll just uh, give you an outline of what I would like to talk about in this presentation because there's not too much time. Uh, so uh, first of all, I would like to say a couple of words about sharing data over the web, um, in particular building data, of course. We're highly looking at uh, using web technologies for building data. Um, second, about link building data. Third, geometry and GLTF. Four, uh, would be the actual server that we are uh, proposing in our article and, uh, and some concluding remarks. So um, a research environment in which we are in is looking at using building data on the web. Um, we would like to use a distributed building model containing all the information about the building. Some would call that a digital twin. Um, we don't only we do not look only at AEC, but also at the adjacent disciplines uh, such as facility management, also heritage, circularity topics. So it's not really confined to the design and the construction and engineering phases, but more in general about buildings itself. We are aiming to look at an infrastructure for automated checking of models or so regulations. Um, that's why we need to formalize our models and our data, uh, but it also needs to be usable and scalable. Um, and it needs to be easily extendable by building experts with limited IT knowledge or some uh, knowledge. Uh, so that's our background. And this also includes authentication, authorization, uh, and um, inter interdisciplinary uh, items. Um, okay. So the general scope of distributed building data is that we have a building life cycle. You can see the uh, icon on the screen. So we have a central BLC building life cycle which go through, goes through a number of phases and we have a whole range of um, um, participants taking part in this process who all have their own uh, network of data and their models that they want to contribute to a shared repository of data. This is not a new topic. This has been uh, investigated many times. The question is how do we integrate this data, for example, geospatial data, product data, and regulation data? How do we integrate them formally uh, so that we have some standards, but also some flexibility to do uh, what we need to do? Um, and this is the usual, uh, this is the common uh, explanation. Here on the left, you can see the islands of interoperability, which is, is an image from 1980s, I think, from Hanus. We would like to move it to a more web environment in which we have um, connected uh, 
silos in which we can do particular um, checks, rule checks, for example, and we have modular micro applications which are connected over the web. So we try to build those bridges here over the web. That's our kind of our goal with this LBD server. So the, and we should have, we would have a, a server on, um, on multiple instances which we can um, connect. connect. Um, okay, so link building data. First of all, I need to say something about the industry foundation classes. So IFC, you can see here on the screen, uh, this is probably known to many of you. Uh, the industry uh, relies much on um, an IFC format, which you can see on the left, and file exchange, which ends up uh, to as files on the right. Um, the, 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 the limit with this is that this is very file oriented and it's difficult to, you basically need to hand over the entire file and then use it uh, and then exchange it again. There are file servers available. We would like to have a more modular approach. So our challenges here are, I will skip a few slides here. The challenges here are that we have a standard, but it's not so modular. It's not extensible and it's not simple enough for many people. Um, and also it's not that much web comp compliant. Uh, so we always need a very big infrastructure to be able to serve the data. So therefore, uh, the proposal and a test was to use linked data semantic web technologies. Uh, I will not go in detail about those. Um, but it, the link building data um, um, approach would be to uh, make a graph, a semantic graph, a directed labeled graph with our building data, which is modular. So in one graph, we have the topology of our building which describes the site, the project, the building, the stories, and the elements, not more. In another module, we have product data. In another module, we can capture geometry, um, uh, geospatial data, and so forth, and so forth. So the aim is to be web-based and data-based, but also to be um, decentralized, modular, and simple. That's all background, background, background. So sorry to bother you with this. But we can rather uh, easily make a graph here of our building to say our site, site X, which is a URI, it's identified on the web, has a building. Our building has two stories. Our stories has a space and it has adjacency. It also has interfaces, which you can see on the right with the um, containing and um, elements. That's, our, that's the building topology, ontology, I will not go in too much detail. Um, and uh, in addition to this, we have certain domain ontologies which allow us to be more specific because we want to say more about buildings than just uh, the topology. So here you can see uh, formal ontologies who say we have distribution elements, it's a bit small. We have distribution flow elements, flow fittings. So we can basically tag our elements with certain semantic uh, classifications. So all web-based. Um, that's one part. And finally, we end up with a graph, which you can see here on the screen. That, is, that represents a particular building, the stories, the elements, the spaces, and all data you can imagine. So great. And it runs on a server. If you can connect to it and query it using uh, semantic query mechanisms. So this is really useful, uh, in, in my opinion. And it has been um, looked into uh, by many people already. Yet, there are still some uh, things, some challenges in this overall scope of linked data. For example, um, security, privacy, and authentication. It, we cannot just push our database online and just say, here is, here is all the data. So we need to be able to handle it. Then we need an intuitive user interface. That's, those are, some say it's, that's just a programming issue. I think it's not. I think it's, it's a, actually a real challenge. And then there's also challenges in data handling because certain data does not fit well into a graph, such as 3D geometry and sensor and tablet data. So our paper actually goes about is about that part, those two. Um, so in the next, the, the uh, solution for handling security is to use an API layer and the solution for handling the data handling is to use multiple data storage uh, approaches. So we're aiming at a, a deployable uh, LBD server project that includes web-based authentication and displays 3D geometry in an interface. That was a challenge. And I've sent Jeroen and Andrew into this. Um, so first, I will 
give a couple of details about the geometry and the semantics, how we can uh, connect them. I will briefly introduce the server and then, and then conclude. I hope I'm still on, on time. So um, what we are looking at uh, for the geometry is we are, have been starting this project from IFC data. True. Uh, so we look from, uh, for, for IFC data and we have a couple of conversion routines that we have uh, used. First one is the IFC to linked data converter. Which you have an uh, URI here. It leads to this graph, but this excludes geometry. So in addition, we have also a conversion mechanism or procedure which ends up with a GLTF format, which is standardized. Um, and that displays geometry in a rather straightforward manner. Um, so in addition to the graph, we end up with the data you can see. Uh, we, we can actually visualize the, the GLTF data, uh, which you can see here on the right. So we have... Uh, and across those two resources, we have the same uh, GUID. Uh, we need to maintain the, the, the ID between the GLTF and the RDF data. And that's possible. So that was a test that we did. So on the left, you can see the graph. Uh, and you can see here the ID of our elements in, uh, in, the, in this graph, or this particular window in this case. And you can also see the same identifier here in the GLTF, which allows us to link it not entirely formally, but through the API, um, which is different from what other people tend to do. So, but at least we're able to combine those two sources. Okay, click. Um, so that's the, so we have the data, so the geometry and the, and the semantics available. Uh, next thing is to basically to try to serve this data combined into a uh, server. And in this part, we have a number of concepts that we follow, and namely we would like to be web-based and also data-oriented. And we want to connect heterogeneous building data. Um, we want to be able to be to federate the data and we need an, an, an user interface. Which sound, okay. Uh, so we ended up with this architecture here. I will not be too detailed here, but this part, the Node Express, this is our API layer, which basically um, manages the, the, the links and the data sources. So this API connects to two databases, a graph database, and in this case, a MongoDB, which is a key value store, which can store the GLTF um, data in an efficient manner. And we have the same identifiers here and here, which allows us to connect the data in this layer and to visualize it in a React interface. And now I have a couple of technical slides um, who show uh, what we have done. So this is the API. Here we are able to manage the authentication, so the access of the data. So this needs to be stored, of course, here, here, and here, so that we have uh, appropriate security. Um, we are able to uh, create a new project. Uh, so here you can see um, Postman uh, interface, to, to which we use to test our interface or middleware, so we can connect, uh, we can create projects. And eventually we can also do certain queries to select data. I will not go into too much detail here. Uh, we can do this both for semantic data, which you can see here, as well as uh, um, non-RDF non data, uh, so such as images, such as 3 geometry, which are stored in the Mongo database. Finally, we have a, a front-end, so a user interface, um, which is a mock-up, of course. Uh, you can see here uh, our interface to create multiple projects. Uh, so you can create a new project, associate people to uh, the project, and then upload data. Um, and in the back, and then after upload, the data is stored in the databases, and we have this interface here, uh, which allows us to view the model, but also to see the tree and then the, uh, the model data. Um, a second prototype, so an entirely different interface, is this one in which we uh, are querying directly the data so we can um, build multiple interfaces to the same uh, data through the same uh, API. And I will wrap up here because it's time. Um, our conclusion is that we are going in this direction. We are not entirely there yet, as you 
can clearly also see uh, we need to uh, stress test further. Um, but I, we think that the combination of multiple data storages, as well as a combination of authentication mechanisms and an API is feasible to work with. Um, and at least gets us out of the, this picture of uh, IFC file data exchange. Um, future work which we are looking at is uh, look located in the middleware. We would like to improve our authentication functionality. Um, and this is, I'm looking here for Jeroen. So we would like to have a more federated authentication mechanism. Um, we would like to have a more stable connection with the triple store API, uh, which is uh, um, GraphDB. Sensor database integration, that's a separate topic. There's always bugs, so we always need to do this. Um, in the front end, we would like to improve our link between the query and the viewer. Uh, we would like to also uh, test validation components, uh, so constraints checking, which is necessary for uh, code compliance checking. So we have formal data. We can basically use the shackle to check uh, certain data. And we are obviously also looking at common data environments. Um, here are some references, and I will end up here. I hope I'm on time. I really hope I'm on time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for your presentation. Uh, we now move to the to the last presentation. Who is you? Come here. You may stay there. Uh, I'll move. Well, I may be here something to simplify Ricardo's task. So I pre-recorded uh, so Ricardo oh, does not okay. have to remember me of the my five my yeah. fifteen minutes. Agora é preciso partilhar este. Não ver aqui em baixo. Não, não. Aqui, aqui, Chesky. Não pode puxar um pouco para trás. É, isso, isso, isso é só para tocar. Espera, é só, é só se assegurar que o som está aí. Não, não, espera, espera, espera. É melhor primeiro ver se o som está aí. Se o som está a ser transmitido, quando se faz o share screen. Eu tenho que... É. That uh, encompasses techniques such as uh, either this, the syntax, visibility of another, and uh, agent based analysis. She tends to bring that to the current and the common architect and the urban planner. Although in the uh, long progress, SCADA is already a proven and uh, academically disseminated instrument. Nevertheless, those sets of methodologies are still very far from. From being a current tool for the common practitioner. Well, the strategies of the scale tools are they are addings of commercial on the shelf uh, current software, Revit and Ashcat for now. They try to answer the common architect concerns about their current projects. And they try to encapsulate the intricacies of scale calculations by doing the Maximum possible automation. Nevertheless, scale tools allows control of all intermediate steps by the unit design. The set of scale tools can be seen in this scheme. Here is the architect, 
easily to provide a CAD project and uh, some information to skeletons, mainly working with from the software package. Well, a list of reports and uh, the achievements in the common architectural language is available to the architect. Then the automation process begins, and according to the demands of the architect, it is several of the parameters. Well, this is the alpha tool. It translates this, uh, the CAD project made by the designer, to this uh, 3D metric space uh, suitable to scale analysis. This is a great advance on the standard uh, scale software because it was the focus of the CAD project already developed. Nevertheless, it's not an easy task and several problems have to be overcome. We must first understand what is a scale model. Our first model, more concrete and with more information, is something like this. A model of volume, a slice of the universal space that we intend to study. We are not addressing now the problem of the selection of this slice, which is nevertheless very, very important. Well, this global volume can be seen, at least virtually, and can have a lot. Uh, and also visibility throughout the volume, fog, uh, visual effects, and so on. Besides the global volume, there is a lot of material objects inside the uh, global space, and uh, those objects are delimited by surfaces that can be seen. Delimited spaces can prevent other objects from being seen by agents, and a certain opacity from transparent to transparency to full opacity and can prevent movement of agents inside the space. This is a passive space. We have introduced the concept of agents, and this introduces another type of space, the active space where the agents can stay view and move. And finally, this concept of model must have an associated operational model that to this is a discretized model. The whole in my points, the objects lie in triangles. The active space by points. So the author tool is going to translate this into this. The geometrical translation of the architectural project, projects in CAD to a scale surface case and ash uh, intricacies. The first thing is we know not to unique mood or character of 2D class. This problem will take the scalable scheme to produce the software only for three because based on objects of uh, the paradigm. The architectural project has a much higher level of detail than the one needed for scale. For operational reasons, time and memory is a small one. Let's say 99% of the information in the architectural project must be significantly disregarded as not relevant. So, techniques are used to compress the information. I'm not going to detail this. Well, other problems are that in most cases, there is no explicit representation of the degrees of transparency opacity of some objects. Also, the current generation in CAD is dedicated to a representation, representation of physical objects of the building. That means construction objects. Nevertheless, the concepts that matter for the core business of architecture seems we are the more abstract, there are spaces and functions. And those concepts are the most simple representation in CAD. They must be constructed from the side of CAD. The important concept in the scan is the active agent whose denotation is people, vehicles, real cameras, and so on. An agent has a certain properties such as uh, dimensions, operations, separations, and disregarding uh, staying, staying and movement, uh, window vision regarding visibility, and uh, regarding movement. The behavior parameters for the uh, agent-based analysis. 
Well, uh, skeletal beta is the machine that uh, takes the passive space definition and creates the active space definition. It analyzes uh, space ability to accommodate the agents uh, regarding designations, calling uh, in the space uh, and range of static and dynamic slope and step admissible for each type uh, of uh, agent. The data tool complements the data tool, creating paths for the agents. It measures the movement trajectories of agents in the active volume. It can also be created by automated processes. Two different machines are available, one based on scale considerations, for example, higher visibility, or agent-based analysis, for example, with attractors and uh, repulsors. Agent uh, Behavior and so on. Besides the genetic definition, scalar spaces can have attributes or properties, allowing the differentiation and aggregation of segments of those spaces. For example, the car space, the pedestrian space, the tourist space, the living room, the bedroom, the square, the hospital, the surgery room, the monument, the living room, and so on. Each concrete analysis answering to the architect in mind will have its own point of view of what set of properties are important. We already referred to this uh, Yato tool. It tries to assign architectural functional attributes to fractions of spaces. For now, the Yato tool only creates a sort of aggregation attribution, grouping near discrete points of the scalar space with the same attributes using clustering machine learning techniques. For example, analysis of uh, different spaces to differentiate convex spaces inside the global spaces like here. For example, in this model, each uh, discrete quantity of the space can be can have uh, multiple attributes. The current five uh, topological representations of scale organized in investment order of the quantity of information and that to a degree of abstraction as a 3D metric space. The 2D metric space, the segment lines network, the axial lines network, and the graphs of the condensed spaces. Each of them has its use, pros and cons, and all of them are addressed by uh, Scalatools. Scalatools defines the precise syntax for each of the models. I'm not going to detail this. The five representations are related to each other. The most abstract general representations are semantic constructions made from the most uh, concrete ones. Tools, Gamma, Delta, and Epsilon are similar to Yato tool. But when it results in uh, same aggregation, attributes to space inside the same scalar model, they only say that a certain portion of space has the same attribute. Delta and Epsilon machines don't stay at that level and aggregate the parts of space in a uh, single entities, uh, creating new scalar condensed models with far less discrete objects in the model. Now come the, the set and data tools. The set tool makes the basic scalar quantities uh, and the data products derive the scalar quantities. The scalar tools quantities are functions which uh, domain the set of points uh, or the Cartesian product of two sets of points belonging to the several discretizations of scalar spaces. The Cantor domain is usually a number. As with the discretization, the domains are numerable sets. Those functions can be represented with a graph language, but not always a flat one. Uh, some special graphs are used, for example, when uh, two different types of nodes are needed. For example, the visibility function is no longer bijective, but it's always directed from the active space to the passive spaces. Well, uh, the main primitive functions in uh, 3D or 2D metric space models are the distance, the visibility and the accessibility between uh, points of the space. The graphs created by these tools expressing the basic uh, quantities of scale are the base for the machines that perform the creation of the segments and axial lines network and the condensed space graph models. Derived quantities such as depth, draws, thinness, accessibility, entropy, and so on, 
are calculated using uh, basic quantities, some use of algebraic, statistical graph theories, not a main artificial intelligence, and so. Well, the result outputs of SCAD analysis have to be readable by architects. The capital provides that as a gathering all the information relevant to the goals of the architect and uh, they deliver that information. Although all the usual SCAD scientific data is available, predefined the templates with easy to understand architectural meaningful reports are available for security, economy, traffic, aesthetics, urbanism, social studies, and so on. Thank you very much for your presentation. No. Sorry. Camera. Yeah. Uh, so we now have how long for for discussion? Half an hour. Half an hour so more than enough. So I open the floor for the 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 discussion. Please go ahead. Uh, Sarah. Ah. 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 Yeah. I'll, I'll open the chat. Of course. We have a, a person friend of hers who wants to ask a question. She raised her hand. Yeah, please go ahead. Y your, your sound is muted. You can unmute it. Good. Okay, sorry, I wasn't sure if it was me. <laughs> Fine. Um, so I had a question for Tazos. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there was some, um, so you were seeing some planning applications and planning policy in the city of London from the work that you are producing. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about those sort of how these understandings of morphological space vis-a-vis -vis the street network are um, impacting how developers or planners might be thinking about organizing the city of London or greater England. Good. Yeah, okay, cool. But yeah, that I, well, it's not actually London. So um, we've been, so this is, I'm part of a kind of urban dynamics lab, which is a huge research project uh, at the, at our school and our lab. So we are partners with a lot of local, I don't know whether you're British. You're um, I, no, I'm American and okay. I, at ETH Zurich, but I'm actually, I live in London, so. Okay, cool. So <laughs> there's, well, so we're part of a big network of partners, well, partners with us, they're partners with us, one of the network, let's say. So that's, that includes like, you know, Birmingham, Leeds, all the kind of Northern, old Northern powerhouse. So a specific application to this, so, so I can go, completely answer your question is with um, the city of Birmingham and the transport network, transport engineers there, mm -hmm. where they could identify from the clusters. And that was also fascinating for me because I don't know Birmingham. Okay, I live in London. I have no idea of the, of what, the, you know, I have a bit, but I don't live there. So they could identify what they called. And I also didn't know at the time, the bus uh, bad bus country which is which is the areas that the bus companies won't go without substitution which means more money for the government to sub substitute for the service being active to that particular area okay pretty much deprived areas low accessibility so with understanding how some areas from leads let's say this is sort of transfer learning right you've got areas in london that uh, have a specific pattern they fall in a specific cluster and we can see that these areas are also marginally not substituted when you move the same cluster and the same uh, spatial characteristics to an area in, in in the northern part of england right which are the probably super deprived compared to you know London areas, huh? then you can identify why this is probably it's going to be or it is already, for example, a very bad bus country or whatever county. Yeah. So we, we've been using, we've been working with them, a lot of um, work with uh, also Manchester uh, local authorities 
uh, black black country, and the guys around them. There is like a like a, a lot of uh, um, uh, local councils around there. So we've been using this uh, at the moment for transport, uh, for big infrastructures, and also the last thing that I quickly jumped is understanding uh, community segregation from massive, let's say, road spaghetti monsters, right? Not mm -hmm. well, not as big as the US, but we do have rail and road uh, complexes, let's say complex structures that they really define borders and they create natural breaks in how the clusters are organized. And then you see a break in the system and then you can go in and identify that, oh, yes, there is kind of a major uh, over kind of, a, you know, um, a rail or something with minimum underpasses and things like that. So it helps in a variety of situations. I try to cut down everything I've done in a, in a very small um, time. Yeah, frame. of course. I, just, I think it's often hard to get planning policy, at least in the U.S., to pay attention to this sort of research. So mm -hmm. I was curious to see how that it's exciting to see that there is some some yes. crossover between sort of yes we are we are also sort of as far as i can well reveal let's say we are also working with uh, certain government at the moment let's say government ministries but mm -hmm. that's as far as i can say so it's 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 actively uh, worked but mainly not mainly not London, because if you're going to pitch something now to the government or someone else for London, they'll be like, come on, you're going to do it like a London centric thing. You got five million already. So we don't we won't give you more money. So essentially, we're do doing this for uh, northern uh, northern areas, north of London, Wales and areas that really need attention, especially yeah. now. Eh? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's even more important. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thanks. I have a question for Tassos too. I was uh, thinking, uh, maybe you already addressed this, but it, if you have uh, uh, two questions, one probably is very basic because this is not my area, but do you, when you calculate the distances, do you, cal do you calculate li uh, distances in, in meters or can you also calculate distance in time? Because if you have a place where you can circulate faster, uh, because there's there's a, a, well circulation is faster by car or by public transportation, does the model take this into account? And then the second question is, do you are you able to compare this, for example, your data, uh, for example, with data from uh, from uh, real uh, real world like from Strava or from other sources that really measure how the people are moving around? Okay. So, uh, well, what, what I do is not really space syntax. Eh? So the space syntax is the big picture usually, and we do things like uh, calculating different metrics in terms of uh, um, uh, metric distances, time distances, uh, so the time to walk between one uh, uh, metro station, uh, metro or underground station, is of course more than actually going through the the pipe eh? uh, underground. So that's a time that's a time hyper jump you can do, and that's part of what we do with our, our uh, kind of researchers in well, in the space syntax side. This work is. That's why it's maybe sometimes it's a bit harder to understand. Is purely geometric. I don't care about how much. It's not about people walking. It's not about simulating uh, agent-based models and things like that. What we already do is understanding things about space by stripping out everything that you know about it and use pure geometry. And it's magnificent to see certain weird patterns that we feel exist that are pure, not well, purely defined, can be purely defined by geometry. Of course, it's not, geometry is not the cause eh? or, or the other way, but this is kind of purely geometric. Uh, but in, of course, you're right that in, in other studies, we do have uh, different types of metrics for um, traveling faster, you know, through air rather than through land. 
And I think your other part of the question is whether we are uh, checking well, other forms of real data, right? Yeah, well, like for yes. example, I read that Strava now puts all its data open if on request. Mm. Yes, yeah. look, because I lead, I lead the research cluster in urbanism, machine learning urbanism, we do tend to massively download all this open data. Strava is yeah, not that open. Uh, well, maybe they say it's open, but it's not really. They don't give you a lot of stuff. Uh, but um, yes, we use socio. We mainly use socioeconomic data. So UK census data, a lot of census data, a lot of uh, uh, multiple indices of deprivation, which is a standard in the UK to understand kind of economic factors, education deprivation factors, accessibility to uh, your health system, your green accessibility to green spaces. So yes, of course, I mean, yeah, the, the, if you want to take it one step further into a kind of a data analysis or what people like to, to say, you know, machine learning, everyone is doing now machine learning, not really. Uh, you, 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 pile, you pile the data there. So yes, we, we're using especially nowadays in the UK because we've got also the problem of the everything in the South being the, the cool guys and the kind of expensive, you know, everything is cool on the South. And as you go uh, up, up, or, uh, up and North, there are issues with kind of uh, uh, deprivation. So this is one of the main things that we're looking at that we try to compare with data that existed for 20, 30 years to understand what it means. Okay, thank you very much. We have a question here. Can you maybe move, come closer? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, here it's okay, I think, yes? Yeah. Or can you sit? Okay. okay. Uh, I think it's again with you. Uh, I'm uh, Hesam. I'm coming from Lisbon and uh, University of Lisbon. Uh, I have two questions. Probably they are a bit simple, but according to your work, I think I didn't get something. Your clusters are coming from the orbits or not? First. And I thought, uh, as you mentioned in your discussion, you use the integ more integration in the work. So all the clusters are working with the integration, not with the choice and some local measures because the clouds and the orbits that you made is uh, working more with the integration. And when you're talking about the segregation areas, those segregation areas are usually coming by integration and depth, total depth or mean depth. So uh, are you using with the, chan with the choice or some local measures to use to draw the orbits? This is the second one. And the third one, the orbits that you make uh, can, because I thought those clusters that you made, uh, it's, it was very interesting for me, according to this uh, uh, division of the space into the all the, according to the region or to the city, it's, it's very interesting. And I want to know if we can use the same thing as those clusters uh, as an orbit that you draw in, the, in one of your slides is three or the slice three or four, which you used as an orbit that you discussed about. Can we use that in the uh, city spaces for, the, for defining the chances as a bypass for the spaces or no? I mean, because it was more real than the uh, than the uh, method of the space syntax that we use. When you use the orbits, exactly, you have the division of- What is the orbit? What, what, I don't know what the orbit means. Uh, you you have the word orbit, orbit but I, I don't mean, know what orbit. Like the clouds that you made are like ah. orbits that you have in this space. Ah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I get so it, yeah. You have the hybrid of everything, so it's not completely very, uh, space syntax generally has this um, division of the step by step by step by step to reaching to the, to the end of the segregation. But when you have the orbit of the clouds, you can have those orbits as a clouds and they are, it's more real. I think it's, as, as you present, it's more real. Can we use that in the local measures also or no? Thank you. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me say something, probably I need to re redo the presentation. 
and really say for every every slide that this is not space syntax. So this is this has nothing to do with integrate space syntax integration, space syntax choice, space syntax anything. Okay, has nothing to do with global and local measures from people that know space syntax. Nothing, not even a single data, not even a relation. Okay. okay. What it has, of course, the essence is there because I worked with Bill Hillier for 10 years now. Okay. Sadly, we lost him, but I, I worked for the space syntax laboratory for 10 years. And uh, a lot of the things ha that I do have in back of my mind ideas that of course, it's Bill's ideas eh, about morphology and space. So every point in that orbit, as you call it, in the, the data cloud is the pure uh, definition. Well, it's a numerical definition of the pure geometry of a local area around you, okay? So you, it's, it's you, it's the center, it's one segment, plus let's say 200 segments around you based on angularity, of course, angular distance. And we also encode the, the scale in order to overcome problems be, uh, from density, rural, urban, and things like that. So it can be a continuous um, uh, kind of a feature space, right? So we don't, I don't use anything that has to do, when I use the word integration, maybe it's not the right word, you're right. On this sense, because for people that really know space syntax, if I say integration, they automatically say, okay, it's Tassos, he's talking about space syntax integration. So you're right on commenting on this. Uh, when I said like spectral integration is how close these points are in this multidimensional space. So, so the, the, the less kind of the more close you are, the more similar you are in terms of morphology. So this is kind of a, um, I don't want to use local to global uh, thing because now we're just erasing all this and it's not about comparing the, the space syntax, you know, it's a 40 year old idea that has some limitations, especially when you're translating from global to local and then you got uh, people asking exactly the same questions as you did, which is a very valid question, if that paper was about space syntax. So by forgetting all of this, we're just trying to understand this 400 dimensional data point, uh, how close it is to another one that might be in another country or in another city, right? Without knowing about whether this is a global or local idea or anything. And because of the similarities in, in geometric configuration and the way that we build space, and you can see it from my slide where I compare the different areas of London between the ones that really look like London, Crescents, you know, Victorians, and the new developments that are, you know, Manhattan style grids, you can really see the, what it means to have the, the, this kind of differences. So the things cluster together. So the core network clusters together in, a, in an area, in, a, in, a, in their own cluster. So that's the foreground network, of course, Again, I'm using Bill's word there, Bill Hillier's uh, wording, but it is the core network. And what you get extra is, of course, the core network is gl global if we want to use the space syntax terminology, but the addition is that you understand the local penetration of that thing. So it's two, two to one, let's say, two in one or whatever. Right. Right? The local penetration of that core network to the adjacent uh, neighborhoods, for example. So that's that's why there is no boundary between local and global, I think. And this is very, to be honest, it's just half of the job. The last slide that I showed is probably the good the good bit, which is a bit more more interesting, but also harder to understand without going from the from the start. Then eh? that's why. So there are a lot of things that you could. Um, uh, say that, but yeah, thanks. I think a, qu a question like this is very good because it helps me also quali um, not sorry, uh, you know, clarify a couple of things that I should have pointed out a bit more in the presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Have one question here in the room. Oh. <coughs> yeah. Well, 
So they're both with white shirts. <laughs> okay. okay, we're good. Okay, uh, not for new tasks, but uh, first I must say that uh, well, more than London, it's the two. Uh, we try to join here in this session. Well, in general, to us, to to solve some kind of uh, abstract problems. Uh, and uh, we must say, and uh, I think I, uh, I yeah. also follow the. Franklin, a bit louder, a bit louder. Thanks, Sharma. I think I'm talking for the academic community. We must thank Tassos and Alan Pen and all the team that produced uh, a tool that has uh, some thousands of. Uh, users and applications, and is very useful for uh, everyone. Uh, but, but it's not as I am uh, addressing. It's uh, it's uh, sorry, Peter. Uh, well, two questions about uh, your uh, approach. The first one is uh, well, the taking the communication. For architects on the BIM uh, or ISC base, uh, is it not uh, a, a little limited? Because uh, as I see it, BIM and ISC are directed to material objects and not to the, well, I insist it's the core business of architecture, it's space and function. And for function for architecture is a mobile function, architecture is a mobile. Uh, so you, you showed us, uh, well, also material production of architecture. Uh, we are uh, maybe our buildings are made of material making, but they uh, provide uh, other things that are the, the main architectural concerns. So. Don't you think that the, the ways of BIM and AFC is uh, not completely suitable for architectural communication? First question. And the second is, uh, uh, sorry. Ah, uh, well, standardization of language, for example, uh, is not only the question of uh, getting the best language. Uh, because if everyone creates his own best language, and maybe there is one that gets less than the others, uh, well, the, the function of language is lost. And the, as I see, the capacity of language to gain uh, the, the world depends more on, uh, I would say, political reasons than. Uh, uh, the political force to impose some language that uh, uh, prevails uh, and not the, the real capacity of the language. Well, what, what, these are the two questions I would like to, to put. <clears throat> okay, thank, thank you very much for your questions. Um, I hope I understood them correctly. Uh, so the first one is about the usability of BIM and IFC for architectural design. And I, I kind of fully agree with you that this, that, there are, that there's more uh, to life than uh, BIM and IFC. Uh, and I, um, in particular, this uh, conference is uh, aiming at this. Uh, so, but yeah, in our case, we are also looking at the engineering construction phases where we do have those uh, tools in which the design is already more finished. Uh, this does not mean that those tools should also be used fully in the design process. Uh, so I kind of fully agree with this. Uh, also, I think we should keep, we should not put everything into a machine. <laughs> I think we can do many things outside the machine as well. Um, so I hope that that kind of already answers your first question and about the standardization, it's kind of similar. So, um, and yes, there's lots of politics, especially in an IFC world. Um, actually, we try to break this area a bit free from uh, that kind of imposing of a standard on the, on the construction industry, because it is limiting. Uh, you always have to kind of uh, try to fit your model into an IFC uh, formal um, standard. 
and it's really really hard uh, for architects and engineers uh, so they go around it uh, they often go around it even though they don't say it that loudly um i think we should so if we look at the formal methods i think we should allow at least to be formal about their exchange and allow those people to formalize their domain knowledge and their semantics and use it to exchange the data uh, and 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 focus less on trying on having to use the standard um i think that is really uh, so that's what we actually try to do but by breaking away from the one file format into a linked data format in which you can make your own vocabulary and uh, and link to it and attach to it and this is really needed also for example for heritage if you have to do <laughs> if you have to do describe a vault of a, or a dome in ifc yeah i mean you're stuck already from the start um so we need this uh this uh the, 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 a bit more freedom and the semantics <laughs> I think everybody in the room agrees here, I think. So, but nevertheless, we also have this construction and engineering environment in which we, uh, that's just there, we try to, we need to, um, yeah, work with it. Okay, is that an answer? Yes. Do we have more questions? Yeah. Okay, so. Thank you all for the presentation. Um, my question is for, I would say, all of you. I, I would ask maybe Peter to start. Yeah, maybe come closer. There's, there's yes. no, no way we can. We are limited by the machine. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm close to the machine. <laughs> uh, Two meters, so, please. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Okay, so, so my question is for all of you, maybe better start uh, Peter Powell's because I think he, he, he reached what I want to, to ask. Um, because you talked about the front end prototype and you said something about testing it. So most of your presentations were about kind of fundamental research. Um, my question is, when will you test some of these systems in a more real life uh, environment? And what, what, for instance, for you, Peter, would be the, the use scenarios or views of the, the, the prototype that you are uh, envisioning? Yeah, God, this is good. <laughs> okay. Can I do a yogurt or something? <laughs> no, I. I think uh, it's very important question to move to the industry. Also, I think. In research, we, in research, we try to aim very much. We aim at a, at a research question. We kind of limit ourselves to a small scope and don't really, and that gives us freedom to do what we like. But the uh, real world is quite different. So we really try to connect. That's why we look into security as well, even though it's not a very interesting topic other than that. Uh, but we have to, otherwise it's not usable. Um, and uh, we need to we try to connect to companies and real buildings to see how they use the data. And you, you can see many difficulties with IFC. And on the other hand, we can see very interesting projects in which you go uh, very deep into the data exchange, including the JSON exchange, API development. People go really far with it. Um, and, this, and this is not only the semantics, it's also the point clouds, all, all of it. Uh, all the AI algorithms, the machine learning, so they go very hard. So I think we need to connect and, and team up with them to build those tools and to test them. Um, for this LBD server project, I think it's still mainly a research project, and um, but it's a it's a container in which we can do tests. And the real world examples are more um, Siemens uh, CDEs, Microsoft Azure uh, digital twin systems. So they need input, and I think we need to team up with them to give the input. Always difficult, and I'm sure there are other uh, other opinion, opinions about the same thing. Yeah. Which is a reach out to our other speakers. Uh, 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 if I may, I have one question for the first presenter, um, and I have two, two, two questions. One is um, in terms of 
uh, workloads or computational workloads, can your method be applied to um, a large environment, for example, a, a city block or to a, a whole city? Uh, my question is, how does it scale? Is it efficient or do you need to work more on that? Method for photogrammetry reconstruction. Uh, so, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, when we test uh, this process and we apply it for a uh, recontrast about uh, one uh, kilometer a square, uh, it's about the size of our campus, and we can process this uh, to rebuild the uh, building models for just uh, 10. Uh, 10 seconds, uh, around, around the second, 10 seconds, yeah, about 10 seconds. It, you, it, it can rebuild uh, complete. So I think it's quite efficient because uh, one kilometer square is quite huge. So yeah, that's it. Sorry, I can hear you. So, uh, so I, I muted myself. Sorry. Uh, uh, second question here is: uh, there are different kinds of noise. I, you discussed that, but there's this noise in the data in the cloud point that comes from from capture, from the the, the reconstruction not being completely efficient. So some points or uh, clusters are not in their real position, but then there must be also noise from, from other, other, other things. For example, in, in traditional areas of Lisbon, people hang clothes outside or they have, in, in some places they have um, um, flags or things like that. How the, is your algorithm the, uh, or does the neural network is it able to, to clean, automatically clean or disregard, not cleaning because it doesn't clean, but to disregard this and, and interpret the, the building facades? Uh, yeah, that's a question. Uh, because we uh, train uh, this uh, neural network to adapt any kind of uh, quality of the, the model. So I think, yeah, it could, uh, deal with uh, all kind of uh, situation in the city, I think. If, so, if I may add to this question, I think this is a very, a very good question, actually. And it's not about the quality of, of, the, of the data you're getting in, so you can get data discarded. But essentially, if you, if you look at the central London or, or uh, even Madrid or, uh, I don't know, maybe Lisbon as well, uh, you also have trees in a very packed way together with very narrow streets, right? So that yeah. makes for, for, the, for just reconstructing the 3D model, it might be, it might need some extra kind of a segmentation process before so you can segment trees and then create flat, flat surfaces as an extension of the facade, for example. So you might need to join a network from kind of a segmentation model and then uh, feed it to your to your thing. I don't know what you think. Because yeah. your example was a bit more open space with buildings and trees that are totally sure. separated. The tree is a 3D object again, if you scan it from, from above, yeah. Yeah, true. Do we have, yeah, we need to, to go to lunch. So I thank all the presenters and also all, the, all of us in the public. Uh, and so we'll see, we'll meet again in, uh, at the um, uh, one thirty. yeah, that's correct. So one thirty. yeah. So in, four, in about 40 minutes, so it will be a, uh, a short lunch, at least for Portuguese, <laughs> <laughs> for Portuguese traditions. Okay, so thank you very much, and we'll meet again soon. Thank you.